Hello and welcome to a special interview for The Wire supported by Glendivitt Books. Has the Supreme Court overreached itself by intervening between the farmers and the government? And secondly, and perhaps more importantly, behind the facade of its intervention, has the Supreme Court in fact tilted in favor of the government? Those are two key issues I should raise today with one of India's top lawyers, the president of the Supreme Court Bar Association, and one of the important lawyers advising the farmers, Dushyant Dave. Dushyant Dave, the Supreme Court has stayed till further orders the farm laws, and secondly, it's appointed a four-man committee to examine them, not because it has any doubts about the constitutionality of the laws, but as the Chief Justice said, to facilitate resolution of this problem between the government and the farmers. In doing this, hasn't the Supreme Court overreached itself and trespassed on the domain of the executive? Well, Karan, first and foremost, thank you very much for inviting me on your program. Uh, the answer to this uh, is twofold. Let me first begin by giving you a little uh, background you see, it's uh, while the Supreme Court has the power to grant stay uh, against any legislation, uh, it rarely exercises that power. I must tell you with deep sense of regret that in December of 2019, I wrote an article uh, which appeared in Indian Express during the winter vacation, in which I called upon Chief Justice Bobde to constitute immediately a bench of the Supreme Court during the vacation and a grant stay against the operation of the uh, uh, CAA. And I said so because I wanted the Supreme Court to intervene at that stage to stop uh, uh, you know, any possible bloodshed which was likely to take place. And uh, I must say with great regret that the Chief Justice Bobode did not heed to that request and it re did result into you know, loss of avoidable lives of uh, innocent men, women and children and thousands are now languishing in jails. Similarly, if you will see just a week or so ago, when the draconian, uh, you know, uh, these love jihad laws, whatever it's called, this, uh, you know, rather sad, you know, piece of ordinances issued by several governments came up for challenge before the same bench presided by Chief Justice Bobde. While he issued notice on it, he declined to grant a stay, meaning thereby in the meanwhile, under these draconian laws, hundreds of people uh, will be jailed across the country in you know, BJP ruled states and they will suffer indefinitely. So, I mean, uh, it's this kind of a selective exercise of power to grant stay against legislation is something which is deeply disturbing. Supreme Court must be a consistent court. It, you know, its laws cannot differ from subject to subject or from bench to bench. Now, having said that, let me say, uh, yes, uh, the intervention now in hindsight by the Supreme Court does appear to be uh, rather, uh, rather uh, difficult to understand because, uh, you know, what transpired on Monday and uh, what really uh, was passed yesterday, the order, uh, really do represent a very, uh, you know, disturbing trend uh, uh, about uh, handling the entire matter. Because if you will recall on the 11th and all the newspapers have really borne out that fact and so have the legal portals bar and bench and live law uh, that during the arguments of, uh, of I and my colleagues who appeared for the farmers had repeatedly requested the Honorable Chief Justice and his uh, colleague judges on the bench. Uh, that we be given a day's time to you know, uh, consult with the farmers unions to find out whether they were agreeable to any kind of uh, you know, uh, committee uh, hearings. And uh, my requests, repeated requests were not granted. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, having uh, declined that, the Honorable Chief Justice had in fact uh, uh, clearly indicated that he's going to pass appropriate orders. He therefore adjourned the matter to Tuesday only for the purpose of orders. And therefore, we did not appear because we had no occasion to appear. And then, you know, all what happened yesterday in our absence, many uh, words were ascribed to me and my colleagues, uh, lawyer friends. And uh, uh, unfortunately, the, the court ended up with passing this order, uh, which uh, perhaps uh, uh, and constituting a committee completely different from what was envisaged by the Honorable Chief Justice on Monday itself. So yeah. I feel... I I just a minute. You're a minute. making a lot I of very important points. Let's take them one by one. Let's first, before we come to the committee, no, look just at a sec. Just a sec. Uh, uh, let me just finish with one sentence. 
in those circumstances granting of this stay really raises more question marks than it answers really the simple approach that the judges reflect in their order that this is to prevent any bloodshed let's look at the many different reasons why people believe in granting the stay and then secondly and separately in creating a committee to look into the matter the supreme court has overreached and transgressed into the domain of the executive to begin with clearly the supreme court is attempting to arbitrate between the government and the farmers not only did no side ask for this the farmers explicitly said they didn't want it and quite clearly this is not the role of the supreme court how does and why does the supreme court take upon itself this role to arbitrate well as i said earlier the power of the supreme court to grant stay against uh, unconstitutional legislation exists there is no doubt about it but uh, you know in a political arena uh, like the present farmers agitation for the court to have stepped in because if you will see the judges had made up their mind when they came uh, to the court on monday and as soon as the court assembled the judges uh, you know just simply uh, uh, told the government that we are going to grant a stay and uh, we are going to constitute a committee and uh, which left uh, in fact uh, the attorney general and the solicitor general quite flabbergasted uh, so <clears throat> it was quite surprising because the judges without hearing anybody had made up their mind about it so uh, yes the judges have entered into political arena in this case uh their uh, their uh, declared objective is of course uh, laudable namely to avoid any kind of bloodshed but uh, i i must say one thing that in fact the judges could have declared the laws to be unconstitutional in a days final hearing because the laws are completely against the law declared by the supreme court for last 75 years and there is a direct direct decisions so therefore to grant a stay at this stage rather than you know confront the matter finally uh, does uh, appear to suggest that uh, the immediate purpose of this stay order is to perhaps uh, relieve the stress that the government is facing on account of the agitation you know the first point i want to take up is the decision of the judges to clearly and willingly and in fact deliberately enter the political arena and i want to cite an example to illustrate why what the supreme court has done is wrong in the 1980s when british coal miners had paralyzed the country in their protests against mrs thatcher's coal policies if the british judiciary had decided that they were going to arbitrate between the coal miners and mrs thatcher's government it would have been widely considered unacceptable and impermissible what the supreme court has done in india is no different they enter the political arena in the belief that somehow they have the capacity the wisdom and the power to arbitrate between a government and a party that is offended with the government it's a bizarre breach of the supreme court's limitations yes in fact the closer to home i will give you a more drastic example <coughs> when the babri masjid issue was uh, simmering again the supreme court decided to intervene politically chief justice venkat chalaya i don't know what a very wise uh, learned uh, man he fell into the trap and uh, you know he took an undertaking from the uh, uh, from the uh, chief minister of uttar pradesh then chief minister late mr kalyan singh that he will abide by the orders and ensure that uh, babri mosque is not attacked and damaged and uh, ultimately it was an egg on the face of the supreme court because the mosque was indeed attacked and damaged and uh, the supreme court ended up by giving one day's sentence for contempt to uh, late mr kalyan singh and as a result of that decision what we have now seen that the supreme court has justified uh, you know uh, 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 allowing the prayers of the hindu groups uh, and declaring that uh, ram mandir can be built on the site of the mosque so really these are political issues where court should really be very clear as to whether uh, it should aid the government or not and if it feels that government has failed which chief justice bobde repeatedly said that the government had failed to bring the uh, break the impasse then there was all the more reason why chief justice should have stayed away from it uh, which uh, uh, you know he perhaps uh, overlooked but you know in this instance the shah dave it's not just that the supreme court has deliberately and consciously entered the political arena to act as an arbiter where in fact it has no business to be i'm going to question whether the supreme court was right in staying these laws after all 
since the constitutionality of the laws was not in question, not a single day's, not a single moment's hearing was held in terms of the constitutionality of the laws, the Supreme Court doesn't have the basis or the grounds to stay them. And the Supreme Court has interestingly got around that problem by declaring that it's not staying the laws, it's staying the implementation of the laws. Now, I put it to you, that is terminological gobbledygook. What is the difference between staying a law and staying the implementation of the law? You are absolutely right. The writ petitions which the Supreme Court was hearing really were, you know, the writ petitions which were brought uh, by some individuals uh, who wanted the farmers to be removed uh, and uh, to unblock the, uh, you know, roads uh, which they are occupying. So the scope before the Supreme Court of hearing these matters was extremely limited. Absolutely right. And there was no prayer whatsoever in those applications for any uh, grant of any stay. Uh, therefore, uh, normally, if there is no prayer for a stay, question of granting stay does not arise. So uh, this exercise is a suo moto exercise that Supreme Court has done. And whatever may have compelled the Supreme Court, we will never know the reasons. Uh, because, uh, you know, sometimes uh, what goes on into the minds of the judges is uh, quite uh, uh, difficult to fathom. So I think you are right that the judges have really gone beyond the scope of the inquiry before them and uh, have really done something which perhaps uh, could not have been done uh, normally and which they have not done, uh, I, I, frankly, in the past for a long, long, long time. You know, I want to pursue with you for a moment this very interesting but inexplicable distinction the judges are making between staying the law and staying the implementation of the law. Now, you know that when a law is not implemented, it's not being executed, it's not being enforced. In which case, if you don't implement a law, it becomes a symbolic law. It remains, in fact, a meaningless statute which is being ignored. It falls into what they call desuetude. So there's no real distinction. And this hairline distinction that the judges are propounding to justify the state is actually a non-existent distinction. Well, uh, you know, I agree that there is very little distinction. In fact, it is hair splitting. <coughs> Perhaps uh, it suits the government uh, to, you know, uh, uh, or soothens the government that its laws are not stayed and the implementation is stayed. Uh, but uh, frankly, there is no difference between the two. Once the implementation is stayed, the laws are uh, dead letter and uh, therefore they cannot really be acted upon. And uh, uh, I, that, that's all. I've, been a fact, I've done a bit of research and I discovered that what the Supreme Court said in 2013 about staying laws is actually something Chief Justice Bob Day has cheerfully not just ignored, but breached. This is what the Supreme Court said in 2013. The operation of a statute cannot be stultified by granting an interim order, except when the court is convinced that the law is ex facie unconstitutional. Now, when you haven't heard even one minute's hearing about the constitutionality of the law, the court simply cannot be convinced that these farm laws are ex facie unconstitutional. And yet, it's gone on and stayed them. So clearly, Chief Justice Bob Day has disregarded and breached what his own Supreme Court laid down in 2013. I completely agree. I mean, the, uh, the judges, uh, even without discussion, could have added one line in the order that prima facie, uh, we do feel that the laws are unconstitutional and they are contrary to the judgments of the Supreme Court given over the last 75 years, but they have not said so clearly. Uh, perhaps the judges, uh, you know, wanted to, they were in hurry to somehow, you know, uh, pacify the agitating farmers in the hope that the agitating farmers would perhaps uh, agree to, you know, stand up from their protest sites and uh, uh, relieve the burden and the pressure on the government. So that perhaps may have weighed with the judges. Of course, they have put it on a larger, uh, you know, perspective saying that they are concerned about the lives of the citizens. 
uh, I'm happy that the judges are concerned about the lives of the citizens, but apparently the judges are selectively concerned about the lives because when a large number of people belonging to minority community were likely to die, I think judges did not show the same kind of concern uh, which they ought to have shown. So I, I, I'm really quite, uh, I would say, amused and deeply disappointed. Let's come to Shantavit to a third aspect of what the Supreme Court has done. We've already discussed the fact that they've entered the political arena by choosing to become arbiters, which they have no business to do. We've also discussed the manner in which and the grounds on which they've stayed, the farm laws, and questioned whether they were right to do so or not. The third aspect emerges from the constitution of this committee of four people to examine the laws. Now, the committee, the committee comprises two agricultural experts, a member of the Bharatiya Kisan Union, and the member of the Shetkari Sangatan. These four gentlemen can only advise the Supreme Court on the appropriateness or the inappropriateness of the farm laws. But that's an arena into which the Supreme Court is not entitled to venture. So once again, when you set up a committee to advise you on whether the laws are appropriate or not, the Supreme Court is clearly indicating an intention to overreach itself. There is no doubt about uh, the fact that uh, the constitution of the committee is an unwarranted exercise. And that's precisely the reason why on the night of Monday, the farmer unions uh, had taken a decision after having discussed the matters with us, the lawyers, uh, that uh, they are not uh, willing to accept any constitution of committee and that they will not be appearing before such a committee. <clears throat> See, the direct negotiations between the government and the farmers have failed. Uh, uh, Chief Justice himself has said repeatedly during the hearings in last two days uh, that they have failed miserably. Now, having uh, I, with the failure of those uh, negotiations, I think what I mean, what can such a committee do is really beyond imagination. It can fine tune maybe, you know, comma and full stop here or there, but that's all it can do. It can't do anything more than that. This is a matter. That's why I had made a specific request to the court that why is it that the government is shy of not convening the sessions of the parliament to reconsider the laws? And this is something where which really should have been the approach of the court. Court could have said, court cannot compel parliament to be convened, but court can certainly advise the government Absolutely. that yes, you are the majority party and you may perhaps convene the parliament to reconsider these laws if the court was not inclined to declare them as unconstitutional immediately. Perhaps yes. uh, both options were available to the court. The appointment of the committee, to my mind, is really a non-starter. You've discussed just now the appointment of the committee from the point of view of the farmers, and I'll come to that in a moment's time. But first, let me take up the appointment of the committee from the point of view of the government. You know, and I know, that the government has the right and the government has the authority to pass good or bad legislation to create popular or unpopular laws. It is not the business of the Supreme Court to comment on those. The Supreme Court can clearly rule on the constitutionality of the law, but the merit of the law is not part of the Supreme Court's domain. Now, this committee can only advise the Supreme Court on the appropriateness or the inappropriateness of the law. In other words, on the merits of the law, but that's an area where the Supreme Court has no business to be. So from the government's point of view, the Supreme Court is clearly trespassing in the domain of policy and it should not. See, two things. One, it's very surprising. I mean, I'm subject to correction. I am told that yes, during yesterday's hearing, neither the learned attorney general nor the learned solicitor general really argued against grant of the stay. So apparently, perhaps the government is happy with the stay order being granted. And, uh, you know, uh, the whole issue being put on uh, back burner by constitution of a committee and giving them, you know, long time for two months. Giving this two months time itself means that for next two months, Supreme Court will not be examining the constitutional validity of the laws. So yeah, Supreme Court has put again, once again, a very important matter in cold storage, as it has done in challenge to 370 CA and many other cases. So I definitely agree with you that, yes, uh, the constitution of the committee is something which Supreme Court cannot go into because Supreme Court can only examine legalities of a law and not the niceties of a law. The legalities of law means constitutional validity or otherwise. 
and that supreme court doesn't want to do and it wants to you know get some kind of advisory uh, from this uh, so uh, this great four experts uh, i don't know even if they gave report and say that no no the law is bad let us say for the sake of argument of course they are not likely to because all four are proponents of the laws if they say that law is bad what will the supreme court do is Absolutely. it going to say that it is bad because of this report it you can't it could say it's bad because it's unconstitutional because parliament had no power to legislate in respect of agriculture absolutely in fact once again in setting up a committee that looks into the merit or what you call the niceties of the law as opposed to their constitutionality the supreme court is breaching what a former chief justice justice an as anand laid down and i'm quoting justice anand he said courts have to function within the established parameters and constitutional bounds courts have to be careful to see that they do not overstep their limits because to them is assigned the sacred duty of guarding the constitution policy matters fiscal educational law otherwise are thus best left to the judgment of the executive and then very importantly chief justice anand added it needs to be remembered that courts cannot run the government but here's the supreme court setting up a body presumably above the government to give the supreme court advice on the appropriateness of the laws thus leaving it to the supreme court to then decide which bit of the laws are acceptable and which are not this is a complete intrusion into policy matters where the court has no business to be well the recent example is the judgment of the supreme court in central vista case it was a classic case where supreme court actually should have constituted committee of independent experts from outside india and within india to really understand whether this kind of a project really is uh, ecologically good environmentally good uh, you know uh, uh, from the point of view of uh, 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 town planning is it good from the point of view of architecture is it good but the supreme court failed and merely shied it away from examining it saying it's a policy matter so when it suits the supreme court says it's a policy matter and what happens is the result is what that the supreme court is unable to decide any case since 2014 particularly against the present government uh, on one pretext or the other while and and each a, 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 virtually every major decision has gone in favor of the government so i mean it's really surprising that the court should have a policy where the court is unable to confront the executive of the day uh, when executive takes unconstitutional or illegal but actions but, but tell me this now that they have appointed this committee to look to look into the merits not the constitutionality what will the court do if this committee i know it's an unlikely outcome but what will the court do if this committee comes back and says there are amendments and changes needed in the government's laws and if the government is unwilling to make them what will the court do i i don't know maybe the court will uh, perhaps uh, per try and uh, appeal uh, uh, to the government as it is now appealing to the farmers to find some solution i mean it's not no part of functioning of the court and <coughs> as i said this whole exercise appears to be really uh, uh, on a wrong foot let's come briefly to this committee and how it's viewed by the farmers that's the second problem with this committee to begin with all the four people appointed to this committee have publicly declared that they support the farm laws they are therefore not a impartial body clearly this committee is loaded against the farmers how can the supreme court set up a committee to investigate the merits of a law and then load the committee literally 100% with people whose views are already predetermined and are in favor of the laws when the farmers want the laws changed how can the supreme court do that and consider it an impartial exercise well first and foremost the supreme court has made a fundamental error in choosing uh, you know the kind of uh, members of the committee the problem before the supreme court of problem of the laws is legal constitutional and these problems can't be addressed by these uh, four kind gentlemen however competent they may be in their respective fields so if you don't have anybody on the committee uh, who has the legal acumen who really knows the constitution of india 
I think there is no point constituting a committee. I mean, is it a is it a committee to uh, go into the economics of the laws? Is it a committee to uh, go into the commercial aspects of the laws? I I just fail to understand what this committee is about. And I I am deep, deeply disappointed that on Monday the Honorable Chief Justice himself suggested that a former Chief Justice should be heading the committee. And then suddenly on Tuesday, when we are not around, I mean, of course, farmers don't want any committee. Uh, uh, the uh, court, you know, brings out these names from its hat and simply constitutes the committee. So uh, the whole exercise is, uh, I would say, and and now that uh, you know, uh, it's in public domain that every member of the committee has, uh, at one point of time or the other, spoken in favor of the laws and against the farmer agitation. I think it's really it reflects very poorly on the Supreme Court that it chose such a committee very very poorly, and I think it hurts my sentiments, but particularly, and I'm sure all those who love the institution that this kind of an exercise was undertaken. For the record, I'll point out that NDTV has reported that in fact Justice Lota told NDTV that he was approached and he declined to chair this committee. As a result, this committee simply comprises four people. Who not only have declared in advance that they are in favour of and support the laws, but they're also agricultural experts of one sort or another. They cannot opine on the constitutionality. All they can talk about is the merits of the law. But that's an area where the Supreme Court has no business to be. So the advice the Supreme Court will get will be advice that it is not. Empowered or entitled to act upon, and if the government refuses to accept this, as you pointed out, all the Supreme Court to do is plead with the government and beseech them to do so. The Supreme Court has, in other words, backed itself into an incredibly awkward corner. Well, I, I definitely would say that the Supreme Court has put itself in a corner. Uh, and i really would wish that uh, judges had had a much greater foresight and vision to if they genuinely wanted to address uh, the resolution of the problem that doesn't seem to be uh, really reflected in the actual order uh, which the judges have passed so i mean to that extent i i don't know it's really not the not the best thing that has happened we're coming to the end of this interview dushantave i have two critical questions i want to put to you firstly do you know what people are beginning to suspect many are saying that that behind the facade of a state which was presented as something that should appeal to the farmers what the supreme court has done is to create a committee that supports the laws and thus will give a victory to the government so the facade is a state that looks as if it benefits or at least is on the side of the farmers but the outcome because of the nature of the committee will favor the government that is the sort of speculation doing the rounds and that speculation undermines the image and credibility of the supreme court let me first uh, tell you something which is uh, very it's on public domain again you know an article that i wrote uh, in indian express on the uh, appointment of uh, justice bobde as the chief justice of india i on that day because you know his appointment came uh, following uh, uh, one of the most uh, disturbing terms of chief justiceship under justice gogoi uh, who was uh, who was uh, you know accused of sexual harassment and yet uh, he was exonerated by chief justice bobde and his colleagues justice indu malhotra and justice banerji sadly uh, two women sitting on that forum uh, and uh, so you know i wrote an piece saying that let us hope that chief justice uh, bobde's appointment heralds a new era in the supreme court and we will perhaps see uh, but at the end of that article in my last paragraph i did say something very very uh, uh, important something very uh, very uh, and which perhaps uh, is now relevant i said that the photographs of chief justice uh, bobde receiving his warrant of appointment from principal secretary of prime minister mr p k mishra has been flashed in every newspaper in the country now that was absolutely uncalled for accepting such a warrant from principal secretary to prime minister and it was really an unjudge like conduct on the part of chief justice bobde 
I was very apprehensive. So I said in my last paragraph that this really does not augur well for the institution. And, you know, that one photograph really establishes link between the politics and the judiciary. And politics appears to have crept into the Supreme Court of India. And that is something very, very disturbing. Now, this didn't happen. Just a minute. This didn't happen here only. You know, Chief Justice uh, Gogoi, uh, when he inaugurated the new Pragati Maidan complex of the Supreme Court, invited Mr. P.K. Mishra and Mr. Uh, Ajit Doval uh, uh, and actually in his speech uh, mentioned about them. They were made to sit in the front row while many of the sitting Supreme Court judges were sitting in the second and third rows. So I do feel very disturbed that the judges who have never ever got uh, connected or been closer to you know these kind of uh, figures in the government are getting proximate to uh, these uh, uh, people and uh, are uh, you know that is bound to have some kind of a you know uh, impact on the functioning of the court in a nutshell what you are suggesting is that in multiple ways one example of which is the formation of this committee, which is going to almost certainly rule in favor of the farm laws and therefore present the government with the victory. As a result of all these instances you're citing, judges and perhaps the chief justice in particular are returning favors to the government. They're finding clever and artful ways of helping the government, of siding with the government. That's what you're suggesting. And they're breaching, therefore, the independence of the judiciary, and they're also breaching the necessary separation that should exist between the executive. I, I, I feel that judges are now, you know, uh, proving. I mean, many judges have gone or publicly on record to uh, to say that uh, prime minister is their hero, or that the prime minister is the greatest uh, gift of mankind uh, to mankind, and uh, have all kinds of adulation for the honorable prime minister. I mean, he may be deserving it. I, I mean, I'm not uh, disputing that. But for judges to say that, invite him. And judges invited him. In fact, uh, Chief Justice Gogoi, I think, invited him to his own chamber in the middle of the night for discussions. And many earlier uh, judges have, uh, Chief Justice Mishra and Chief Justice Kher, I think, have also invited him uh, for uh, discussions within the common room where judges sit. And I feel that that kind of proximity would have been unheard of uh, before Chief Justices, uh, first Chief Justice Kanya or Chief Justice uh, Mahajan uh, and all those great Chief Justices that we had in the past. I mean, that kind of bonhomie was absolutely unexpected, was unbelievable and uh, was completely to be avoided. And this kind of proximity is certainly perhaps weighing in the minds of the judges in the judicial making process. And that naturally will be then, you know, uh, uh, nuanced by, by their uh, great uh, uh, respect for the Honorable Prime Minister. And uh, that uh, really comes in the way of uh, uh, decision making uh, in one form or the other. It's, it's a subtle way of coming, but it's not nice. I mean, judiciary so, not only must be independent, but must appear to be fiercely independent. So in a nutshell, what you're saying is Chief Justice Bob Day has let down and betrayed the highest standards of integrity that are expected from the Chief Justice of India. He is not living up to the standards of integrity, independence that are expected of a Chief Justice of India. I won't uh, go to that extent. I would only say that I am deeply disappointed at the functioning of the Supreme Court, particularly uh, because Chief Justice has no time to take up other important cases like challenge to Article 370, challenge against CAA, uh, you know, uh, arrest. I I'll give you one more example. You know, there is a there is a case which I had been pleading with before Chief Justice Bobde for last six months. I gave up now out of frustration where we wanted certain television media channels and certain newspapers uh, to be inquired by the government on the uh, reporting of the Nizamuddin Merkas case, which was extremely uh, unbecoming of the you know uh, free press and uh, uh, you know uh, for several uh, times uh, he would simply adjourn the matter sometimes he would make uh, some observations uh, against the government but would not uh, do anything i mean uh, all that we wanted was that there are existing laws please ask the government to take action under the existing law and he failed to do that repeatedly so it really surprises me that the alacrity with which he really intervened now is uh, something <laughs> disappointing deeply disappointing
we've come right to the end of this interview, but there is one more question I feel I have to ask. It's not directly connected anymore with what the Supreme Court has done. We've discussed in great detail how the Supreme Court has overreached itself and trespassed on the domain of the executive, and it was wrong to do so. We've discussed in detail how this committee looks and appears as if it's designed to pass a verdict or an outcome that will favor the government, and that again weakens confidence in the Supreme Court's integrity. But now I want to raise one last issue, and it's to do with something you said to the Supreme Court on Monday. You gave them an assurance that the farmers would not carry out a tractor trolley parade on Republic Day. On what basis did you give that assurance? No, I never gave an assurance. I think uh, you are absolutely wrong in uh, you know equating that as an assurance. The only uh, the debate was in respect of disruption of the Republic Day parade, about which the learned Attorney General spoke. And I was immediately, as a as a lawyer, not uh, uh, as an officer of the court, I quickly retorted saying that these uh, fears were completely without any basis. And in any case, I said that all these farmers come from Punjab and Haryana. Every family of theirs has one member in armed forces. They are the people who respect uh, you know, armed forces and they have great respect for the Republic Day Parade. And I said, I have no doubt that nobody is going to disrupt the Republic Day Parade, which is a fact. The unions have themselves said that we are not going to disrupt the Republic Day Parade. But, but having a rally independent of that is nothing, some, something about which I did not say a word. In fact, I, I specifically said that on that, I will have to seek instructions and uh, 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 we were never given time to seek those instructions. Thank you very much for clarifying that because both the media the next day, the newspapers in particular, seem to interpret what you said as an assurance. And it seems that Chief Justice Bob Day yesterday, Tuesday, also understood what you said as an assurance. But now you're clarifying that you didn't give an assurance on behalf of the farmers. You only expressed your own opinion that farmers are loyal, that they have the interest of the nation at heart. Their sons go and fight for the country. They will not do anything to disturb and disrupt the parade. However, we may yes, carry say, out their own parade. Say, Karen, Karen, one, 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 one thing. Fortunately, my every statement has been reported by uh, Bar and Bench, the legal portal, and it's available on YouTube. Every newspaper uh, which came on Tuesday has reported what our my dialogues and my submissions were. And if you read them in totality, you realize that there was no assurance whatsoever given by me. In fact, the Times of India uh, clearly records uh, in its uh, uh, yeah, in its uh, uh, block that uh, when asked to make a statement to that effect, the so-called assurance by the learned attorney general, Mr. Dave took a somersault and said, I will not make such a statement. Now that itself proves that no such assurance was given. Thank you very much for this clarification. I thank you for this interview, Dushan Dave, and I thank you for helping the audience understand the two areas where it does now seem as though the Supreme Court has extended itself and arguably not behaved or responded correctly. It's overreached in terms of staying. It's overreached in terms of wanting to enter the political arena and arbitrate between farmers and the government. And certainly the constitution of the committee suggests that the Supreme Court has been less than fair and has loaded it against the farmers. Thank you for clarifying issues. Take care. Stay safe. Thank you very much. Thank you.